is dynamic fees. So let's see here, what do we have on the notes? So first, I guess, just give us like, a, I know on the C chain, we use EIP 1559 style dynamic fees. And um, yeah. do you wanna sort of give us a, explain it like I'm five, give us a high level on dynamic fees if you can. Yeah, sure. So the idea of dynamic fees is uh, Avalanche, the C chain started out with a static fee and it was set at, actually at this point, I don't even remember. I think it was 470 nanovox per, uh, was like the gas price. Connor, is that right? I don't even know. Actually, I, don't know. Yo, I was like, it was 225. And then you're like, oh, no, no, no. You're right. It was 470. Yeah, yeah it was 470. 470. And then we brought it down to 225. And so at that point, it was just a, a network upgrade was to reduce the gas price. It was a static thing where every transaction paid at least that price. And so that meant that even if the network has absolutely nothing happening on it, which at that point, when it was 470 nanovox, was pretty much what was happening. If you scroll really, really far back in that stats set of box, the network thing, you can see where there are very few transactions. Um, and so that meant that at that time, since there was very little demand for transactions or space on the blockchain, we could have done that pretty cheaply. But because the price was fixed, it wasn't possible to do that. And so we borrowed very, very heavily from EIP 1559 um, from the, the great folks at Ethereum, which obviously we borrowed uh, lots from. They tweet about how much we borrow from them. And even though they joke about how much we borrow from them, we really appreciate it. Uh, love their code. Um, and EIP 1559 is just a, a really, really great um, feature. And so for them, uh, the way that they use it is they have a base fee which uh, is set on a block. And so that base fee is the minimum amount that any transaction pays. And then it, transactions can also pay a tip on top of that base fee. Um, and so what happens is the tip is paid towards the miner in order to incentivize the miner to include that transaction in a block. And the base fee itself is actually just burnt. So that's why EIP-1559 was considered as like a bit of a bullish thing for Ethereum because there was this notion that there, a lot of it is going to be getting burnt. Not all of the fees will be going to miners. And so there's going to be a little bit of a deflationary effect that there's going to be less Ethereum in circulation. And therefore, um, it's going to become more valuable. For us, we've always burned all of the fees. Um, so there wasn't as much of a change there. But what we did take was they also have this notion of based on the utilization of the gas that's in any given block, the base fee is modified at each point in time. And so what ends up happening is we borrowed that notion where if the, net, if the actual network utilization is higher than some target, then the gas price, increase, the base fee increases. If the network utilization is lower, then the base fee decreases. And so we did have to modify this logic uh, somewhat substantially in order to support the notion that we are not a blockchain where a block is produced every 10 seconds. It's asynchronous. It's closer to every two seconds that a block is being produced in our system. And so we had to modify those calculations a little bit in order to support the fact that we kind of have a rolling gas window where how much gas has been used in the past 10 seconds as opposed to in the previous block. And then based off of that, if that's above what our target utilization is, then we can increase the gas prices in order to make it so that um, it'll become a little bit more expensive because if we're nearing what our target utilization is, uh, if we're going above what our target utilization is, we want to actually disincentivize people from sending as many transactions. We want the system to actually balance out. And so if we're actually largely below what that target utilization is, then we can actually decrease it and make it a little bit cheaper in order to provide not necessarily an incentive, but just to make it cheaper for the people that do want to transact, make it easier for them to do so. And so one of the big um, misconceptions that people have is that the avalanche network, uh, like when the fees get high, transactions stop going through. This is really not true. Uh, what's actually happening is that people were submitting transactions at a gas price that was no longer above the base fee. And so and this, is, this will lead into a conversation about what is also so cool, not just about the, um, the mechanism of adjusting the base fee, but also the dynamic fee transactions that are interested in the IP1559 as well. Um, but what actually is happening is the base fee is adjusting to compensate for the fact that there is a higher amount of network activity. And so all of those transactions that are at a base fee of 25 GUE, which is our, our current uh, minimum, um, all those transactions are no longer eligible to be included in a block. So if there are 100 transactions that are sitting in the mempool, all at one, uh, 25 GUE, but because of the amount of activity that's going on, that uh, base fee has actually increased and is being at a, a slightly higher sustained level, if it's say like at 50 GUE for some period of time, and that means that those transactions can't get included and users get upset and they think that 
uh, their transactions aren't getting included. They think that avalanche is slow. And in reality, avalanche is just adjusting. If they increase their gas price, those transactions will still go through just as quickly as normal. And we actually just released a tutorial uh, that Raj worked on uh, on your team. So a shout out to him for building out a great tutorial on how people can adjust their fees in MetaMask. And the really cool part about dynamic fee transactions is how it actually is into what's like the best behavior to use if you're, if you're using MetaMask or just issuing a transaction in general. Um, and so that gets into like the fundamentals of what is the dynamic fee transaction. Um, so before we get into that, what is like a, the original style of a transaction? And originally a transaction just specified a gas price. And so uh, if you submit a transaction, there's a set gas price, that is exactly the price that's gonna pay for every unit of gas. And so it's much easier to calculate exactly how much it's gonna be charged. But if you don't know what the base fee is going to be and you don't know how much it's gonna to cost to get included, then you might wanna include more information. You might wanna have some mechanism to include more information. So you can say, well, if the base fee is this, I'm not willing to pay it versus if the base fee is this, I am still willing to pay it. And so that's where EIP-1559 dynamic fee style transactions get involved. And so those, instead of providing a static gas price for that transaction, what they do is that they provide a maximum uh, fee and a maximum priority fee. And so what that means is that instead of providing a gas price of 50 GUE, uh, they provide a maximum fee of 100 and a maximum priority fee of let's say 10. And so what happens is, if the base fee stays at 25, then they're not gonna pay the full 100 that they said that they were willing to pay. And so they're gonna, it's essentially like a second price auction where instead of paying the full 100, if the base fee is 25, they pay the 25 plus their tip on top of that. So if their tip was 10, then they would end up paying 35 or essentially a little bit above what the base fee is as like an extra thing in order to incentivize people to, in order to incentivize for it to be included. And so what you can do is you can actually put in your actual true price. How much are you willing to pay for your transaction to be included? And you're not actually going to pay a substantial amount more than it unless the base fee actually goes up that high. So that if you submit a transaction with a max fee cap of 100 and a priority cap of, uh, let's say, 10, and the trans uh, the suddenly the amount of network utilization goes up and the fees jump from being pegged at around 25 to 50, you're still not going to pay 100. You're going to pay 60, uh, 60 GUE for a, a transaction to be included in block at 50. Uh, that has a base fee of 50 GUE. And so that's a really cool thing because now you no longer have to worry about, oh yeah, my transaction is stuck. I have to issue a new one. You can actually just submit one transaction where you submit your actual true maximum price that you're willing to pay and the actual price that you're willing to pay above the base fee in order to get included a little bit faster. And so if you just have that information, you can very easily decide it and include it in your transaction and it'll be executed as quickly as possible. The thing that I've realized now and that I'm, is, that no one actually knows what their actual true price is. <laughs> Nobody submitting on MetaMask has any idea how much they're willing to pay if suddenly network utilization goes up. They're really just click a button, MetaMask recommended this gas price that costs, let's say five cents. Yeah, I'm willing to pay five cents and they go. Um, they don't really think about, well, if the network utilization goes up and let's say I'm like doing some swap on Pangolin, um, well, like it kind of depends how much you're willing to pay. Maybe the trade isn't as good at that point or something like that. Uh, so they don't necessarily think about that. So what we did in the tutorial is we wanted to just recommend reasonable values for those. Uh, and then we kind of, the assumption was kind of, people will just use these reasonable values and then uh, things will just work better. And if people want to take the time to actually evaluate and decide what their actual maximum they're willing to pay is, uh, then they can do that and they get an even better user experience out of it. Unfortunately with MetaMask right now, um, the way that their suggested gas prices work is that if you put in a maximum fee and maximum tip that are substantially higher than what their recommendation algorithm finds, it provides a warning. And we didn't want to scare users, so we decided. And they're also, in addition to not wanting to scare users, they've also made some huge improvements to their gas uh, gas price estimation. So it is actually a, a very, very, very good you know uh, user experience to just use that as well. So we decided not to say this whole spiel about how great dynamic fee transactions are and how people can use them to just submit their true price and get a very seamless user experience. Um, but we're also working on a tutorial of how to do this in JavaScript as well. And so that is going to be a little bit more detailed about this, um, about how this works and provide, uh, provide exchanges as well as other, other integrators uh, with the opportunity to use this type of transaction and get an even better user experience. 
Yeah, I was just reviewing the PR for that today. And so there are a couple of C chain APIs. There is um, C, there's a C chain dot get base fee, and there's also C chain dot get max priority fee per gas. So these are RPC calls that you can call to get those two values from which you can calculate the max priority fee per gas and the max fee per gas. And then you create a transaction of type two, which is the IP 1559 with I'm guessing web three or ethers. And then you send that to the full node. Um, the tutorials should be merged in the next couple of days, as he mentioned. Um, something that came to mind as I was thinking about that, and if you don't know the answer is it's totally fine. Um, presumably subnet EVMs also have the IP 1559 style dynamic fees. And so I'm wondering what are the implications if somebody launches a subnet and launches a Gabriel token and uses it instead of Avox to pay fees and then they're giving fees to, to the validators, does that throw off everything you just said or does the same kind of paradigm work in that, in that world? Yeah, the same paradigm works. They can still pay the fees in the native token of that subnet. And so yeah, they can they can still pay the fees with that, so it'll, it'll still work exactly the same way. If the so they could do like ETH, they could give the tip to the miners and or the validators, and they could burn the other one, or I suppose they could give it all to the validators or whatever. That would be a modification. Um, we did actually we did actually provide that modification. So that's another optional config that people can use to say what should be done with the the fees. And um, I'm actually not entirely sure how that modification works if that's sending the entire fees to the validators that are proposing it or if it's just the tips. Um, but either way, anybody that wants to can very easily modify that. That's probably a 10 line change in order to change where those fees actually go. Right now on the, the C chain, those fees are just sent to uh, what we have taken to calling the black hole address, which is just 0x01 and then a bunch of zeros. Um, so it's just a, a hex address that does not correspond to any private key that we have. If anybody discovers it, um, we've also added in protection. But they would think that they were very rich, and uh, Zeno Trace would show that they're very rich. But we've actually added in protections to make sure that if somebody does discover that collision, they do not get access to the funds. Oh, really? Um, so my quantum computer in my closet, I can't use it to get that money. Then, dang. Uh, there's probably there's a lot of money in crypto that your quantum computer can get. Uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it too much. But, I'm going for yeah. them Satoshi coins, baby. <laughs> yeah. The interesting thing, so this is actually one of the changes that uh, additionally we migrated in from, from Go Ethereum. And it was really interesting to, to see why this PR existed because I kind of saw this PR and I thought they're really protecting against the hash collision. That's, you know, I mean, a lot of things would be broken if somebody was able to find this. So, or if somebody found a reliable way to find, uh, you know, if a quantum computer was able to do this, things are going to start breaking crypto all over the place, not to mention the actual financial system and the entire internet. I mean, things are very broken of crypto. Nuclear breaks. launch codes, HTTPS, yeah, exactly. like, I mean, everything yeah. is pretty screwed at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot to, to worry about there, but there, you, people can do a brute force search. And so the really interesting thing was, was on this original PR, they found that there was some estimate. I didn't look into ex their exact math, but it was, I don't know how back of the envelope it was, but there was some estimate that in order to, find one of these um to find a collision with an address with a specific address actually it would cost about 10 billion dollars and at that time i think uniswap or it might have been another exchange a decentralized exchange had what had more than 10 billion dollars on it so if you think about it like unis if you can <laughs> actually find one it actually becomes not such a bad idea to spin the hash power to do that uh yeah so it's it was pretty interesting to see that cryptocurrency has gotten to a point where, you know, the, the assumption, it, the assumption that cryptocurrency is built on is like, you know, hash collisions, they're not going to happen. And it was really interesting to see that in we, at least one context that's starting to be a little bit less secure. Um, not that I'm particularly worried about this. I don't think anyone is going to be investing $10 billion on the off chance. Cause there is variability to this too. I think that was an expected value calculation. Um, but I'm not that worried about it, but it was just really interesting to see that even by back of the envelope calculations, we're getting to that point. So one, I want to go back to one thing that you you said a, a few minutes ago about people not knowing what fee they should pay. And now I'm just I'm just kind of putting my my thinking cap on, and I'm wondering. I think maybe maybe we're just going about the fee paradigm all wrong because I guess what people really care about is like how much am I going to pay for this transaction, like total, not like how much I gonna, am I going to pay, like at, what is the gas rate. It's just like, it's almost like we need to re recalculate it. Like I'm willing to pay $200 of gas, but I don't know, like based on the price of ETH, like how much gas is this actually going to take? 
like what's the price going to be like when it executes and i just i wonder if we need like a paradigm shift there of like thinking about it differently trying to price it in like total value because like it's hard to set something that would be like static for like all transactions because not all transactions are priced equally uh they cost different amounts of gas like doing a simple like if i was sending avox from person a to person b is very cheap but uh doing a calling a function that mints 20 nfts is going to be quite expensive so i i like i almost want a gas independent way to just price my transactions just say like i'll pay like whatever the actual gas fee is as long as the total cost is like under this amount yeah i mean that's a great point because i most people if you're if you're just looking at the i mean in metamask or just in general you're you have this parameters you have to set are the max priority fee and the max fee cap, but that's not really, you're completely right. That's not really what people care about. One thing that uh, MetaMask does, however, provide like, in, I think it's in actually like, the next screen over, it does provide, here's the total cost of this transaction. And that's even easier to do so when it's in uh, just like a simple transaction uh, that doesn't have these dynamic fee parameters. It's just a simple gas price because then there's an estimate of how much gas it's going to take to execute that transaction, as well as a hard cap on the gas limit of that transaction. And you can see a little bit more clearly exactly how much it's going to cost. Um, but you're, you're definitely right. We could definitely provide a better user experience there if we just made sure that people were seeing the numbers. Here's what I expect to pay based off of the current base fee, current network conditions. Here's what I'm willing to pay up to in order to get my transaction executed quickly. And the other variable here too is this is just to be eligible for inclusion. You know, if there is really a huge amount of contention, uh, then just because their transaction is staying above the base fee doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be included within two, two seconds or three seconds. Um, it's not, there's not like a exact amount of time that it's going to take. And so like if the question is how much are you willing to get your transaction included in the next block, your transaction still might not get included in the next block, you know? Um, so it's not a perfect answer. There's not, I'm paying to be included in the next three seconds because that's not exactly a deterministic question where there's not a set price that if you pay, you will be included in the next three seconds. I am That's wearing my, my MetaMask oh, shirt. What's that? I am repping MetaMask today. I do have one of my- Oh, is that a MetaMask shirt? shirt? Yeah. Nice. I don't oh, think I've really? ever seen MetaMask gear ever. Oh, they yeah. actually, I, I have to say they have the best, uh, shirt designs in crypto like i, I definitely like, don't see the little fox on there though is, where's is there anything it's, that looks it's a, it's a kaiju oh. fox oh, oh that's actually really cool it is, is that what kind of metamask shirt yeah it's like it's like godzilla monsters like uh it's godzilla cool. versus metamask <laughs> yeah basically uh, it's a, nice. one of them actually they have some multi-armed uh, i don't I, I don't know all my kaiju but <laughs> Where'd you, okay. uh, where'd you get that one? I know you've been going just to the, these. Just the MetaMatch, uh, MetaMask merch store online. Oh, really? I just, oh, yeah, nice. they, they actually have a really strong uh, brand does it brand and like designs for their merch. So yeah. I looked, they had a lot of cool shirts that I liked. So I just bought a couple because <laughs> like, yeah, I use MetaMask every day.